I'm starting off here with about one and a half kilos of clay. That's around about half the amount I'm expecting to use to make the beaker based on calculations from the measurements of the shards. And uh, contrary to popular belief, I'm not starting off with a little disc of clay and building coils onto it. I'm starting off effectively with a thumb pot, pinch pot, whatever you really want to call it. Um, distinctly the fastest way of, of building a vessel. And I can rough out the basis of the bottom half of this beaker very quickly. Now this scalpsy beaker is quite a beast, quite a big one. Um, something like about 18 centimetres across at the rim and about 26 centimetres in height. I reckon probably is going to give it a, a volume of something like uh, four and a half litres maybe, thereabouts. That's uh, quite a beaker. But it is uh, a very nicely produced one. It's quite obvious that uh, whoever made the original was quite an accomplished potter. This wasn't an amateur effort. Uh, somebody who'd never touched clay before. This was somebody who had a good understanding of the material and how you manipulate it. And as you can see here, um, the basic start of the pot getting up to a form which uh, will then take a coil of clay to build it up is a fairly quick process. It's something you can learn to do in a fairly short time. And you can alternate between pinching and coiling and actually working into the palm of your hand. And when you work into the palm of your hand like this, what you're doing is you're using your hand as a mould, basically, and moulding the form of the pot. And I've got fairly fixed in my mind the form that I'm going for. Of course, I'm trying to copy somebody else's pot. The original potter had in mind their own pot. Although it's also quite apparent that uh, styles of pot, and style forms, styles of decoration, continue through for centuries, if not millennia. So uh, the styles are handed down. I suppose that means you wouldn't actually have to think too carefully about what you were making because you'd be used to making it. Although it is also quite apparent that people use their creativity to do these things. Now, what I'm not going for here is I'm not going for the finished form. I'm going for a built-up form that can then be refined. And by refined, I mean thinned out and moved towards its final form. The surface smoothed out, quite often by scraping or just shaping with the fingers as you go along. And as you can probably see there, you can actually start to, you know, you can form from the inside by using your fingers to actually work up the inside of the vessel. And it, it has the effect of smoothing the inside out um, and draws clay upwards, as you can probably see inside there. You can see the clay being drawn upwards as we go. Now, the shards that I've seen of this pot appear to be around about eight, nine millimeters thick, which is uh, quite a thin pot for its, uh, for its size, quite a fine, refined pot. There we go. That's probably about as far as I'm going to go with that at the moment. The thing about pots like this is it's quite good to uh, put them aside and let them rest. Although this one, this clay, the clay is relatively stiff. As you can probably see there, it's a very coarse clay. It's got quite a lot of chunky stuff in it. That uh, that seems to be quite apparent on the surface of the Scalpsy Beaker, that it's uh, 
it's had quite a lot of grit in it and uh, some of that grit is actually quite near the surface and has slightly eroded out and has possibly been the start of some of the cracking on that beaker. Um, you can see that eroding out there. But I'm working up now to a reasonably uh, refined midway point on making this beaker. So I think the time has come to add another coil of clay and to do that I'm probably going to put it onto a slight turntable or tournet. Uh, the base is also not quite as wide as I want it to be eventually but I'm leaving that, I can broaden that out later on. You'll see now that I've transferred the pot to a turntable which you might consider a cheat but uh, Quite honestly, a couple of flat stones with a bit of sand in between would serve the purpose just as well. So I am using a modern turntable to turn it around. Um, I'm just slightly wetting the rim there because I am going to add clay now and I want it to stick quite well. So a little bit of moisture on the rim there helps. Now I'm going to uh, make what you might consider a coil here. But again, I'm not uh, doing it in. Uh, quite what I call the uh, play school method of coil making. I uh, do make a very rough coil quite quickly, just squeeze it out, what I need for the job, and I'm going to basically add almost all the clay I need for the rest of the job in one go, keep a little bit aside just in case. You'll see it's quite a short clay, quite, uh, quite crumbly, it's got a lot of coarse material in the clay here. Um, what I'm doing is just really fixing that clay into place because I'm not going to use that sort of build and, uh, and scrape together technique as I say that, uh, that I do tend to call the play school coil technique. Um, I'm using the method that's used really in many parts of the world of simply adding material. I'm adding material that is now going to continue to be used to build up the pinch pot if you like oil pot. so now now I'm just really centering that if you like joining it together getting it into place getting it where it's uh, wanted and starting to make use of that clay and it's a little bit uneven in places I'm probably not as efficient at this as the uh, original potters who created it they've probably been rather faster than I am rather more efficient but this is basically the technique and what I'm starting to get is a part that's starting to approach the sort of height of vessel I want. I'm not worrying too much at this stage about form or, or evenness, that can be taken care of later. All I'm doing is building up, working the clay in. Now a lot's been said about things like diagonal bonding of clay, the idea that potters went to great effort to create a diagonal join. Basically in what I've just done there, joining the clay on on the inside of the pot and working it upwards and now just smoothing in the joint on the inside, I've got that diagonal joint. It's happened. It's happened quite naturally. It's not been forced. It's not been specially prepared as a diagonal joint. It just is a diagonal joint. And what I'm doing now is working this clay around to even it up and bring it up into some semblance of order. Very quick, very fast. I just want the pot to be approximately the size I want it to be. And not the thickness, but it's a bit thinner, it's a bit thicker than it will be in the final form it's approaching the right thickness. What I'll do is I'll finish off by working towards the form, scraping over the surface to even it out, again which results in some of those um, artifacts if you like, the scratches, the drawing of clay over one, uh, uh, layer over layer that is found in original examples and as I say has led to misconceptions perhaps about the way they are constructed. I think in actual fact there are probably as many ways of building a pot 
as there have been potters throughout all time. Um, because everybody has their own little nuances, their own subtleties to how they build a pot. But I have never come across an ethnic example of a potter who builds using little coils of clay piled one on top of the other to form the shape of the pot that you then scrape together to form a solid wall. It's just quite an inefficient and slow way of doing it and what uh, most people in an agrarian sort of existence don't have masses of is time to waste. Um, time possibly for subtleties of decoration and things but I don't think uh, I don't think messing about with inefficient forms of building would be a way of doing that. There we go, so we're getting up to a reasonable size now. I haven't actually measured that, but I think that'll be approaching the sort of 26 centimetre height that I'm looking for. And certainly any slight additions to the height that I need can occur right at the end here. But um, we're getting in the right direction. And as you can see, we've started to even up that form very quickly. Um, the two pieces of clay are now very, very firmly joined together. Um, I do notice in the Scalpsy Beaker the uh, point at which it has perhaps cracked in a ring. It's somewhere near the top here, in this sort of area, which again is now the point at which I've joined it. Um, it again, it suggests sometimes that potters allow pots to dry out too much before adding the next coil of clay. I doubt that, generally speaking. I think. Uh, I think it might have happened occasionally, but uh, uh, I don't think it would happen very often if you were called away perhaps to look after the baby while, uh, while you're building a pot. Um, I think more likely what we're seeing are joints which are affected by grease on the potter's hands. If, if there's an ineffective joint, it might well be because the rim of the pot that's been formed is slightly greasy. And um, in an environment where the nearest bathroom might be several millennia away, uh, that would be quite likely that you would have grease on your hands. Particularly if, as I suspect, pot making was a job that was carried out around the domestic hearth, um, where you might be multitasking by uh, doing a spot of cooking in between times. Um, getting your hands a little greasy. And of course clay does affect the skin quite quite dramatically. I mean, it does draw moisture from the skin. Uh, I tend to apply uh, hand creams to maintain my skin. It might well be that uh, potters of the past would have applied some uh, grease to their hands to uh, to ease the uh, drying. And if so, then uh, maybe that is uh, one of the things we're seeing in that uh, in the way the pots can separate long joints. Right time to start to think about form. I'm going to add in the last little bit of clay just to bring me up to where I want to be. I do need a little bit more height for this just to get it up. So again, just wetting the rim a little bit, just give me a bond. And this time quite a small amount of extra clay. This will just bring us up to the uh, full three kilos. I originally estimated would be needed for this pot. That's going to be around about right. As you see it again, that short crumbly clay. There <laughs> we go. Just going to work that around the rim. into place again on the inside again as you'll see on the inside because that way you're working the pot inwards all the time the, the tendency when you're hand building a pot is for it to want to uh, move outwards to spread um, anybody who's perhaps had a go at this at uh, for a first time pot building the tendency is to end up with a plate rather than a pot so I'm um, getting height it's probably the most difficult thing to do in your hand building. Certainly helped by either the clay on the inside rather than the outside. 
and certainly not adding the clay over the top. Although the, that can be done and, and does, I mean it does happen and uh, probably results in uh, what's been called tongue and groove joining on pots if you, uh, if you add the clay at the very top of the, of the wall of the pot and it descends over either side you are going to end up with what appears to be a tongue and groove joint. So uh, again, because what, what you what you do is you smooth the clay in to join it together, and in doing so, form flanges that pass over other parts of the already constructed pot. As you see, I'm just pinching this wall again now, working it upwards, building it to a height. And I also see in the Scalpsy beaker uh, one of the fractures does appear to be. A sort of delamination of two layers of clay that have been built over one another, which is quite, which is exactly the sort of effect that you will get doing this last coil of clay on the top here. It will give me a slightly laminated surface of two layers of clay, and again, if there's any grease between the two, that will tend to make a slightly poor bond that might not uh, decide to separate until long after the firing possibly several thousand years after the firing but even so still still will be a slight weakness that's, um, that's one of the things that you do find in pottery that weaknesses don't always show up early on or in the firing they can show up long after the pots have been fired and finished something professional potters like myself have to be careful of Customers are not too pleased if the pot falls apart once they've got it home and got it full of soup or drink or whatever they're using. There we go, we're bringing this up to a reasonable height now. I just want to get that rim fairly even at this stage. It, um, I can tidy it up later and we'll smooth it over and even it out. But basically if you can keep the top of the pot and the bottom of the pot under control all the way through, the bits in between can be brought into control. If you let the top of the pot get out of control, that is to say get, let it become very lopsided and even it would be very difficult to persuade it to come back into line later. So that's what I want is that reasonably even shape. Not the actual shape of the beaker yet, but uh, shape. And I can start to just smooth out on the inside and work my fingers up on the inside. I can use a scraper later because this is quite coarse clay and uh, does take its toll on your fingertips if you're doing that for a long period of time. We do know from some impressions on prehistoric pots that uh, prehistoric potters quite often had substantial fingernails. There's a, a pot from the uh, Neolithic pot from the Thames Valley which has uh, the tip of a finger impression inside of it, which reveals that the uh, potter had quite a substantial extended fingernail on the end of their finger. So, um, obviously didn't wear them away a lot, scraping the pot with the fingertips. Um, probably using scrapers and things like that to do that job for you. There we go. And I think at this stage I'm going to walk away from that and get a scraper and come back to it to the get the final form in a few minutes. Now in this next part I'm going to be using various tools to actually finish off the pot. I've got a sort of scrapers here, uh, bone ones, ones made from a sheep's shoulder blade, slate, just simple pebbles, oyster shell, any of these will do the job and they're all uh, tools that would have been accessible to the original potters. Um, I think I'm going to go for the slate one to work the inside here. Yeah, I may well work with the oyster shell one in view of where the pot came from. Um, first job really I want to do is to work that base out a little bit. So I'm going to just uh, work across the bottom of the pot on the inside, scrape it across and uh, working the base outwards a little bit. I want that to be uh, approximately 11 centimeters across the base 
when it's done it can't be far off now um, and then up the wall of the pot now you'll see that as I do work up the wall uh, what happens is it bulges it outwards and uh, to some extent you can see small cracks appear and that's again that what we call the shortness of the clay the fact that the clay has limited plasticity it's got an awful lot of grit in there that grit is going to help in uh, in the firing it's going to make the pot fire in that in the open firing much more easily than it would if uh, if it was a fine clay a fine clay tendency to trap moisture in the firing and a tendency to then uh, allow that moisture to blow it apart by filling uh, small cavities in the pot there with uh, steam and blasting them apart. The, uh, the grit has the added advantage that it actually opens out the clay a little bit, uh, allows little interfaces between the clay and the grit which form channels through which the, the moisture can escape allows the pot to dry and empty its moisture much more easily and the danger isn't actually over in a pot like this on the fire once you've passed 100 degrees centigrade because there is chemically combined moisture in the clay which probably won't leave the pot until uh, 4 or even 500 degrees C so uh, there is still moisture in there lurking waiting to blow your pot to pieces to cause what are known as spalls where large lumps of the pot blow off the surface but it has to be said that the fact that the this beaker has relatively thin walls will also help it to survive. The thinner the wall of the pot, the less likely you are to get the um, the moisture causing major damage to the pot. I'm just going to work up here on the inside a little bit, and then I'll come back and work the outside, which will uh, seal up some of those little shortness cracks which have developed there. So this is now well, quite the way around. Always trying to be very even to work right the way around the pot on one job before you move on to the next job. Now I'm going to have to move around this pot slightly in order to work up the outside. But here we go. This is now, and you can see straight away what we start to do is we start to make those little cracks and crevices disappear and you end up with a much more even surface so it spreads the clay somewhat and I'm working upwards so I am marginally increasing the height of the pot all the time because I'm actually drawing the clay upwards giving myself more material to work with up near the top so that I can actually extend the pot a little bit taller and you can also probably see at this stage that we're starting to develop that beaker shape that very distinctive beaker form. Scalpsy beaker has its uh, has its shoulder if you like, its neck uh, quite high on the pot so that's what I'm trying to keep here, I'm trying to keep to that idea. Um, I'm not trying to be too slavishly uh, tied to measuring and achieving exactly the same measurements as the original pot because the original potters wouldn't have made it that way, they would have made it in a much more free manner and I'd much rather keep the spirit of the pot rather than millimetre true measurements so it may be slightly var variance from the original pot when it's finished but it will be close and here we go, we're getting now quite a quite a nicely evened out pot just give those surfaces a bit smooth over and later on when i am uh, finished the forming and I've allowed it to stiffen a little bit I will just use a lightly wetted hand over the entire surface of the pot which will sort of form a slip layer a thin slip layer over the top um, I think in general generally uh, slip wasn't applied to these pots as a separate layer but you do get what might be called self-slipped pots, that is to say you just use your wet hand over the surface to raise slip, raise a thin coating of clay from the pot and coat the entire surface of it. There we go. So we're approaching that beaker form quite nicely now. Probably time at this stage to go away and leave it for a while. I should actually stiffen up 
and give me the opportunity to do a little bit more work with it. Although again the gritty clay does allow you to um, carry on working the wet pot for much longer than you would manage if you were actually working with uh, a fine clay. A fine clay tends to become very wobbly in the uh, in the construction quite quickly um, and need to be dried out much more take much more care of building it whereas the gritty clay actually has a sort of mechanical bond if you like it uh, the grit in the clay uh, makes it move in a slightly different way a way which allows for you to uh, to work it continuously there we go I'll do for now Right, I have done about half an hour's sort of tweaking, smoothing and fixing since last you saw this pot, so off camera, um, less exciting bits of doing the pot. Um, the shoulder of this pot, the neck, is around about 7 centimetres down from the rim, um, which is an almost perfect reach for my thumb. It's, it's, it's often interesting to see that, that they fit the sort of anatomical lengths of thumbs and fingers quite perfectly and this one in this case seven centimeters is really a good length down there the original has a sort of raised cordon around this neck here which I'm going to do now simply by bringing the clay up from below rather rather than adding it on I'm simply going to use the spare clay that is at the shoulder here and raise that up a little bit to produce that uh, that raised cordon which is the only sort of raised decorative feature on the on the whole finished pot. Everything else has been uh, uh, engraved in using a, using a flat edge tool. So this will form that raised cordon. As you can see, that's very easy to do, and there is a little bit of spare clay where the change of angle is on the on the shoulder there. It also means that this is quite totally firmly bonded to the pot whereas if I added a cordon on there I would have to make sure I stuck it on really well but if I use the clay that's already part of the pot it's already bonded in there and you don't have that problem. Okay so we've had about uh, 20 minutes extra tidying up again off camera just a little bit to make it neat and tidy. What I'm doing now is I'm scraping the inside to push it out to what's going to be the final form. A bit more of an even curve to it there. Um, bring that out. It's smoothing off the inside at the same time. I'm uh, just using a, a pedal here. Ideal tool. A smoothing action and raises the clay up at the same time, pushes it outwards to give it that nice beta form that I'm after. So, so as you can see again that slightly short clay is uh, cracking up a little bit as I do that. It's not going to be a problem because that will be solved by simply smoothing over later. And you remember I was talking about working over it to raise a bit of slip on the surface, that will happen in a wee while. Just get rid of the worst of them as I go on, just to uh, make sure I don't get any splits building up in the, in the pot. See it's just really the outer wall here. What's also happening of course on the inside as I, as I work over, that you can't see from there, is that I'm pushing any uh, protruding grits and things back into the wall of the pot. That's of course pushing them out towards the outer wall of the pot which um, in a few minutes when I start to work in the opposite direction I'll be pushing them back again. So there we are. We've got uh, quite a nice smooth finish inside. We're pretty much pretty close to the form that I want here now. Uh, certainly once I've worked over the outside. Let's see if I work around here using that uh, little piece of uh, sheep shoulder blade here, the scapula. I've got uh, gives a nice scraper just to work over the outside. And again, same thing, I'm uh, evening up the outside, moving clay around a little bit, not very much, just a small amount, but also pushing those bits of grit 
down into the surface any any big bits of grit that are sticking out as this moves over them they tend to get pushed back if there's anything that's just a bit too big I might well go onto it and actually force it back in um, and you can actually see that effect occasionally on prehistoric pots where, where a piece of grit has definitely been pushed down into the surface just to get rid of it to, to hide it you don't really want to lose the grit out of it because as I said before that's going to uh, ensure that the firing uh, doesn't crack or burst the pot. The grit's there as a protection against that. It reduces the plasticity of the clay at the same time, but it, uh, its main function is to ensure that this passes through the fire unscathed. And as you can see now, we're approaching that final beaker shape that I want. It's uh, easing up the surface. The last process before decorating, I'll say, will be to use a little bit of water on my hand and work over the surface just to raise up a slip and smooth it all off. There's quite a serious crack. And actually you can see one of the problems is actually a huge piece of grit. That's, that's so big that I will take it out. That's huge there. I'll use a little bit of this clay off the scraper here push it into the hole that's been formed there. Oh, and another one, two together, that would explain everything. Two very large bits of grit. This clay has been picked over at the start. Um, it's a natural glacial clay, this one. <coughs> a Northumbrian clay, not a, not a one from Butte, I'm based in Northumberland, but it's a clay that uh, corresponds to the sort of clays you would expect people to be using. It's a glacial clay. It is full of grit, often known as boulder clay for obvious reasons. Um, the grit's been picked out when I started off, but it's not all gone. There's some still in there, so just occasionally while you're working, you'll find the odd bit. It's a bit on the huge side, and in fact, again, from the original Scalpsy Beaker, you can actually see some quite large pieces of grit that have broken the surface and actually have forced their way outwards. If that grit is limestone, um, you can get the problem that after firing, if it's gone over about 800 centigrade, it becomes quicklime, which rehydrates after the uh, after the firing, expands the crystals in it and pushes bits off the side of the pot. There we go. That's pretty much where I want to be now. Um, let's say I might just go around just even up this cordon again, make sure it's tidy. It's not particularly even on the original, so I'm not going to not going to stress over getting it completely uh, even thickness all the way around because the original wasn't. I uh, but I do want it to be fairly neat and tidy. Yep, all the way around, back to where we started from. Oh, yeah. That now is pretty much the form of the beaker as it stands. And as far as I can see from the photographs I've had, it is approximately the size. It is a huge beaker, this is a big pot. There we go. Alright, now finish off the surface, that's sort of self-slippingly, just working over with a wet hand, just a small sort of massage of the surface, just to raise up a thin layer of slip, which will smooth it out, finish the surface, cover over any small cracks or crevices, and also seal in some of those grits that are very close to the surface. It's just, uh, quite surprisingly, gives you a really quite neat finish, ready to take the decoration. And it's certainly a finish that's evident on quite a lot of ancient pots. It looks to me like the Scalpsy Vico was probably finished in something like this way. You see that soft, shiny which will dry back very quickly. The, um, the body itself absorbs some of this water, of course. The rest will evaporate off fairly quickly. 
and then you'd be left with a uh, uh, surface that can be decorated really fairly quickly. And I'll be getting to that in just a few minutes. That is going to be a very lengthy process though. Making the pot, quite time consuming. Decorating the pot, very time consuming. It takes many hours. Um, you can find that even on quite a small beaker you have six or seven hundred individual impressions of a tool to decorate it. This is a large beaker. I haven't actually counted how many it will be, but uh, I imagine we'll probably be approaching the thousand individual tool impressions on the surface of it by the time it's finished being decorated. Obviously indicates a desire to produce something very beautiful despite the uh, time employed in doing so. Yep. Almost there. This is quite a fast process as you can see. Hear that sort of sort of sound of the whole vessel at this stage. Something I always enjoy sounds a little bit like a, a leather vessel. And of course, we do use the term leather hard for clay when it's in this state. The clay will shrink a little as it dries, so the pot will be a little bit smaller once it's dried, but it will only be a small amount. Um, most modern commercial plays you'd expect to shrink by about 10%. This on the other hand has so much non-plastic material in it, so much grit and sand, that the shrinkage just likes to be considerably lower than that, probably something in the region of 4 or 5%. Uh, I'll just work that round over the rim the inside a little bit. And then allow it to sit and dry. Grit still trailing around on the surface there. There we go. That's got it. Ready for decorating. Okay, at uh, last this pot's ready to decorate. And that's what I'm going to start doing. I'm going to be using a small slate tool, um, slightly sharpened edge, nice curve to it which allows me to roll the decoration on. And you'll see that this is a very long-winded process. I'm going to start at the top here, just starting to apply the first band. And what you actually do is you work round with one impression after another to build up lines of decoration. And this, um, as I say, this decoration is going to take some considerable time. Working round and round and round. Being very careful at this stage, the pressure I put on I have to counteract with pressure my finger from the inside. If I press too hard at this point, I could easily crack the rim. I might even produce cracks that I can't see at this stage, but cracks which later during the firing would uh, would cause me real problems. I'm going to open we need now bands. Here and here. I'm going to work this way now, working back around the pot. The trick is to try and maintain the same level as you work around the pot. Now, with sm smaller pots, I've worked with the pot in my hand. Uh, this larger pot, I'm simply going to break it if I try and do that. So I really do need to do it here on the turntable and uh, it's going to make it a little bit more difficult to do because I have to get the tool to the right angle to work with. There we are, not bad. Not too bad a link up there. And now we want a second line just below that one. Just a little raised, almost cordon. As I said before, the uh, one round the neck of the pot there is the only actual properly raised decoration on the pot. 
rest is uh, just these incised lines or impressed lines that are built up with a flat edge tool. And you can see that I'm starting to build up that decoration now. Leave one around there. This defines the edge of that cordon. The surface is still a little bit sticky in places. It's been drying now for a couple of hours since I uh, since I slipped the surface. And it's still sticky in places. But it's important that I don't leave this top too long before I start to decorate it because otherwise it's going to become fragile and easily cracked. Just corner there. And here. Two mini little cordons either side of the main one. As you can see, I haven't been keeping count, but it's now already dozens of impressions I've put into this pot, and I really have only just started. This is going to take a long, long time for the decoration. Now, up here we have diagonal lines cross over there. Right, I've been decorating this pot for uh, about half an hour now. As you can say, there's still an awful long way to go. It is a very, very slow process. Trying not to take too much care over it, uh, in as much as I can see uh, on the original pot, this has been done in a slightly sort of haphazard way, possibly because of trying to do it at speed. I'm trying to speed up the decorating, not um, not work too slowly. It is always an issue when you replicate a pot to try not to improve upon it. I can already see that to some extent my decoration in the upper part of the neck there is in fact a little bit more tightly organised than that on the original pot. So that's something I have to be aware of and try not to let myself do. And not to worry about too much if I get the occasional sort of overlap or something of that nature. somewhat.
see in this band that the um, netting pattern has been done at a slightly sort of wider spacing. A uh, bit um, yeah, maybe maybe the uh, person doing it is starting to get tired of the uh, of the pattern. I'm fairly certain it would have been decorated from rim to base rather than the other way around in as much as the rim dries first and you need to get that done before there's any risk of it starting to crack. It's unusual to try and decorate in the opposite direction because by the time you got to the rim it would be so dry it would be difficult to impress the decoration into it and uh, it would also uh, have a risk crack in the room of the pot, which once done, that would essentially be the end of it. I think I'm going back at that stage. sensible thing to do at this stage. I might well do that. Actually turn the whole thing over to make it much easier to get at that now. be another reason for the spacing difference that when we turn the pot over it slightly presents at a slightly different angle and um, just makes changes the way the person operates with the tool. 